Good morning, North Palm. Thank you, Jesus. Wow, what an incredible honor to be in the house of the Lord today. I'm telling you, God is, is so good. Take a moment right now. I, I just feel to do this. Um, lift your hands with me. I just bind any spirit of witchcraft that's come to cloud your mind in the name of Jesus. And I decree, I decree mental clarity over you in the name of Jesus. Every weapon formed against you, I negate right now by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. I place the blood of Jesus over your mind and over your heart. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for what you're doing, Lord. We lift our hands and worship to you. Oh, we bless you, Lord. We bless you, Holy Spirit. Thank you for the sweet move of your presence this morning. Thank you, Holy Ghost. We bless you today. Now, with your hands raised, pray this prayer with me. Holy Spirit, open my ears that I can hear what you have to say. Open my heart. Make it receptive. I give you permission to move deep in my life to form my heart, to form my character. Jesus, have your way in me today. Amen. Praise the Lord. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Thank you, Jesus. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 for we are his workmanship. Amen. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. Just let that seep down into your spirit. We are his workmanship created in in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Listen to that, that same verse in the Passion Translation. We have become his poetry, recreated people that will fulfill the destiny he has given each of us, for we are joined to Jesus, the anointed one, even before we were born. God planned in advance our destiny and the good works we would do to fulfill it. Now, listen to that from the Amplified Classic. For we are God's own handiwork, his workmanship recreated in Christ Jesus, born anew, that we may do those good works which God predestined, planned beforehand for us, taking paths which he prepared ahead of time that we should walk in them, living the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us to live. Wow. Man, that is such a powerful truth of Scripture that Paul releases to us. There are four truths that I see here in Ephesians 2.10. I believe it says on your notes, Ephesians 4.10. Please forgive me. Oh, that's correct there. It's wrong on my iPad. The spirit of truth comes out the projector. <laughs> Hallelujah. 
Four truths. First of all, there's life in Christ. Life in Christ. Created in Christ Jesus. Secondly, there's purpose. Purpose. Number three, there is intentionality. No accidents. Intentionality. And fourth, there's destiny. I right, Paul said we are his workmanship. The word workmanship in the Greek means a product, like fabric, like a, a tailor is putting together a beautiful garment. We are his workmanship, and it, it means something that's made. You need to understand this. Workmanship is the final expression of, of the creator. Workmanship is the final expression of the creator. When I hear the word workmanship, my mind immediately goes to carpentry. I love beautiful woodwork. I love nice leather, nice leather work, and I love beautiful woodwork. I love the old homes downtown Charleston. Have you ever been in any of the old mansions downtown? And, and you see the elaborate moldings, the crown moldings, especially the wainscoting, the baseboards in these homes. It's so incredible in detail. And their fabrication and their installation. Those joints that are put together, when you look at a corner, you can tell if there was a real carpenter at work. If it's not painted and there's, there's no um, caulking. No caulking. Caulking covers a multitude of sins. God created caulk. So my work would look good. But when a corner is caulked, it's rounded. When, the, when a real carpenter puts up molding, I had the opportunity when we, we pastored our first church. Um, we had, there was this old shotgun home. It was like a Charleston home, but it was, this was in Saluda, South Carolina, and it was like you know, two and a half, three hours away. And, and it had just been gutted, the house had. There was no sheetrock. There was only the wood studs on the wall and the most incredible woodwork inside. The ceilings were all sandblasted. The Wayne's coating was sandblasted. The staircase going upstairs had just been sandblasted, and it was red heart pine. If you'd lit a match in there, it would have incinerated in a moment. <laughs> but it was the most beautiful woodwork elaborately done. And, you know, some of it had to be repaired. So the, the gentleman that was helping us that was actually doing the work, I, you know, I was dumb and just, just out of college. Didn't have a brain in my head. Thought I knew everything. And, and he told us, he said, I, I asked him, I said, you know, because we didn't have a, that was the parsonage. There was, there was no place to live but that. Well, how long will it take to get it done? Because it had just been gutted. There was nothing, there were no windows out there. He said, oh, about three weeks, we can get it done. Well, nine months later, <laughs> <laughs> and, and in the meantime, we're living from members to Patricia's parents' house, going back and forth one week with the members and one week with, with her family. And I love my family, my Patricia's family. It was a wonderful experience. <laughs> Why would you laugh? I'm sincere. <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> but I watched this guy this general contractor, do the woodworking. He had a little coping saw. And he knew how to cut that corner so that when you put them together, you could not tell where one piece started and the other one stopped. It was absolutely beautiful. You didn't need to paint it. It was just gorgeous because he knew 
what he was doing. That was workmanship. So workmanship is the representation of the one who created the object. Workmanship is a reflection. It's a reflection of the skill, the intentionality, and the devotion of the person that created it. It is the quality that reflects the heart of the one who brought it into existence. Now, you are his workmanship. Look at the person next to you and tell them that. You are his workmanship. You are his workmanship. You're not an accident. You're not a twist of fate. You're not some happening of chance. You are the workmanship of Almighty God himself. There's a passage of scripture I want to share with you. And so, so just follow with me in your word because there's, there's a good bit of it here. Psalm 139 verse 1. Oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thoughts are far off. You, you ever felt like nobody gets you? You comprehend my path and my lying down. You are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You have hedged me behind and before. You laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's high. I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the utmost part of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and my soul knows very well. Did you hear what David said? He said, I'm, you're fearfully and wonderfully made. And now he's talking about himself and he said, marvelous are your works. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lower parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. And in your book, they all were written. When were they written? Before you were formed. The days fashioned for me as yet they were none of them. How precious also are your thoughts toward me, O God. How great is the sum of them? You're on his mind. If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. That's God thinking about you. When I awake, I'm still with you. You need, if, if you have a struggle with self-worth, you need to really read that chapter every day because you are special to God. You are special to God. Life is found in Christ for we are his workmanship created in Christ. You, he, you, he knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb. You didn't have life until you were in him, created in him. The word created is conveying an idea of proprietorship of manufacturer. He made you, he owns you, you have his stamp inside of you. Did you get that? Now recently... I purchased a new guitar. You see, I'm from Tennessee, you know. 
I was born in La Follette, Tennessee. It's the poorest county in Tennessee, Campbell County. My dad pastored a little church called Lake City, not South Carolina, Tennessee. I believe they've called it Rocky Top now, but anyway, that doesn't matter unless you're a Vol fan. But when you're born in Tennessee, you get a shotgun and either a guitar, a banjo, or a fiddle. So, so I got a guitar. But, you know, and dad pastored little churches all over Tennessee. That was back in the day when pastors were there about two years and then he went somewhere else. And it was every little tore up, divided church, I think, that was in the denomination. We at one time were at in the state of Tennessee. And there was one little town that we, dad pastored at. It's called Hohenwald. That's weird. Hohenwald. It's a little German town. It's right there on the border of Middle Tennessee and West Tennessee. And, and it was small. It was divided. It was a mess. Um, but, and, and the only music that was in the church were two old men playing guitar. And one of them had a 1960s model Gibson Hummingbird. Oh, my Lord, that thing was beautiful. Man, it was like bluegrass heaven. <laughs> Some of you don't know what bluegrass is. You just need to go to YouTube. You'll be enriched. <laughs> it's the hillbilly version of gospel. But I've always wanted a Gibson Hummingbird. And I got one about two weeks ago. Yeah. Yeah. But I noticed inside, when you look inside the, the hole, there's a stamp. And that stamp is from the manufacturer, and it says genuine Gibson on it. And it says, made in Bozeman, Montana, USA. <laughs> and it's guaranteed against faulty workmanship and materials. Well, I like that. That is so cool. When I was in high school, I had a Gibson, but it was, it was an irregular. And it was stamped on the back of the neck, irregular. <laughs> It was a beautiful guitar. But you know that always bugged me? I hated that. There are a lot of people that look in the mirror and they see irregular. But you're not irregular. You are a unique, one-of-a-kind masterpiece created in heaven, created in Christ Jesus, and you have a purpose and a destiny to make this world a more beautiful place to live in. Do you know that by adulthood, you have more than 60 thousand miles of blood vessels in your body. Do you know that is more than enough blood vessels to go around the, the, the circumference of the earth twice? And those blood vessels, blood vessels supply your tissues and your organs with oxygen and nutrients and they keep your heart pumping? According to the American Heart Association, if you have an average resting heartbeat of 76 beats per minute, then your heart is going to beat 4,560 times in an hour. And 109,440 times your heart will beat in a day. Your heart does more physical work than any other muscle in your body. The average heart pumps 2,000. 
1,000 gallons of blood per day. In a 70-year lifespan, the average human heart beats more than 2.5 billion times. You know, your liver filters all of the blood in your body. And it breaks down all of the poisonous substances. It breaks down alcohol. It breaks down drugs. It produces bile that helps you digest fat. And it carries away waste. Your brain generates enough electricity to power a light bulb. Your brain contains about 100 billion microscopic cells called neurons. So many that it would take 3,000 years to count them. 3,000 years. Outside of Christ, you are dead in, the tres- in your trespasses and sins. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. Momentito, por favor. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins in which once you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath just as others." You need to get this. You came alive in Christ. Hope came into your being. Joy began to flood your soul. Peace began to captivate your heart. In Christ, you were made new. Before Christ, you were dominated by the devil. Before Christ, you had no hope, you had no peace, you had no joy. But since Christ came into your heart, you were born again. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if any man, anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. New creation, old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. In Christ, you discover your purpose. Ephesians 2.10, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. Acts chapter 10, verse 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good, look at this, and healing all who were oppressed by the devil for God was with him. Matthew chapter 10, verse 1, When he called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. Verse 7, and as you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons, Freely you have received, freely give. Listen to Matthew chapter 10, verse 5 through 8 in the message translation. Jesus sent his 12 harvest hands out with this charge. Don't begin by traveling to some far off place to convert unbelievers. And don't try to be dramatic by tackling some public enemy. Go to the lost the confused people right here in the neighborhood, tell them that the kingdom is here. Bring health to the sick. 
raise the dead, touch the untouchables, kick out demons. You have been treated generously, so live generously. Did you see that? What are the good works God created you to do? Why were you fearfully and wonderfully made? Why did he put breath in your mortal body? Why did he bring you to planet earth? Why did he bring you to Charleston, South Carolina? To go to the lost, confused people? To tell them about the king and the kingdom? I'm telling you, Bill Gaither hit it right years ago when he wrote that song, The King is Coming, The King is Coming, The King is Coming, The King is Coming. Tell them about the king and the kingdom. Bring health to the sick. Bring health to the sick. It's, it's time that we stop embracing the sickness of sin and the sickness of iniquity and the sickness of perversion and the sickness of, of all of the garbage that Satan's putting over on us, the vomit that he's trying to cover us in and say in the name of Jesus, I bring the health and the healing of the blood of Christ. To raise the dead. It's like we're living in the walking dead. There's zombies all around us. I hated that show, by the way. It was the craze. You know, I, I tried to watch that thing, but it was just so stinking gory. Ugh. But as disgusting as that was, that's what we're supposed to be doing to the demons that dare bring their garbage in our home. When you go into the school and you're met by zombies, bring Jesus. You know, the walking dead was so horrible because they had no recourse but to cut their head off. They had to kill them. They had to stab them in the head. But you know, that's what needs to happen to this society. They, there needs to be a mind change that comes in this world because the thinking is all messed up. The thinking is all twisted and warped. But when Jesus comes in your mind, when his thoughts come in you, then you begin to see clearly, think clearly, feel clearly. He straightens out your soul, your mind, your emotions, your will. He gives you hope and peace and life. He gives you healing. He gives you health. He takes away the garbage and the filth and, and the destruction destruction of the world. He lets you see that the sun is shining, that Jesus is Lord, that is on the throne, that this world was not created for the devil. It was created for us. We've been given dominion and in the name of Jesus, we declare his kingdom come. His will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Satan is the trespasser, not us. We are the ones that belong here. This is the test territory of Jesus Christ. This is the nation that belongs to the Lord. I am a child of the King. He owns it all. And so he said, we're to kick out demons. Quit coddling the devil. Kick him out. You can't counsel devils. You can't reason with devils. You can't sit down and have a pleasant conversation with the devil. He hates you. He wants to destroy you. So just go ahead and say in the name of Jesus, I command you to leave. Listen, you were designed to walk in a purpose. The word walk is a Greek word that means to tread all around, to walk at large. But get this. It's walking as proof of ability. Not your ability. It's his ability in you. His ability his ability in you, proof of ability. 
You live, you deport yourself as, as a votary, as, as a, it's like a person who's taken a vow, like a, a nun or a monk, and they live, they're walking as, the, as committed. Everything in your life, every essence of your being should reflect commitment to Jesus in what you do and what you say, how you conduct yourself, how you do your business, how you go into education, how you go into government. It should be, I am a child of the living God, and I'm bringing the kingdom of God. God to this earth and I give notice to the devil you're not welcome here living out your faith brings about a manifestation of the power of God that is the proof of his ability to save to heal to deliver to reconcile to redeem to transform you were created to be a change agent in the world God has called you to be a change agent. You are called to fulfill his purpose wherever you go. Your story is more than just your personal life. It's a part of the greater story of what God is doing in the world. So you've got to step into your role as a representative within the sphere that God has placed you and unleash God's power all around you, changing the world for the better. And here's how you become a change agent. View yourself as a problem solver. Look at the person next to you and tell them you are not a problem. There are some people, when they walk into the room, it's like the problem just came in. But you are not the problem. God created you to be a problem solver. You are a problem solver. Why? Because when you walk in the room, Jesus walks in the room. When you walk in the room, the Holy Ghost walks in the room. He is the guide. He is the counselor. He is the truth. When you walk into the room, every solution of heaven walks into the room. There's no problem, no obstacle that's too big for you because Jesus is in you. You are the problem solver. You're the problem solver at school. You're the problem solver in business. You're the problem solver in government. You are the problem solver in family. You're the problem solver for the church. It's time for the lifeless, dead church to come alive in the power of the Holy Ghost and start solving the problems of the world instead of condoning the sin of the world. You're the problem solver. You need to eliminate the divide between that which is sacred and that which is secular because all things are sacred to the Lord. Business is sacred. Government is sacred. Education is sacred. Media is sacred. Arts and entertainment are sacred. The family is sacred. All seven mountains belong to the Lord. And you need to prepare for your assignment. You need to start taking seriously why you're consuming H2O. Why water? 70% of your body's water. You need to start understanding why you need to have oxygen. Why is it important that your body be long, have longevity? If you stop living for today, you'll open the door for tomorrow. It's time you understand you have a purpose, friend. You're not, you're not some chance experiment. Your daddy wasn't an ape or a monkey. No matter what your mama said. Now, now you need to start engaging in spiritual warfare with, com with some confidence. 
Quit being a mealy mouth, jelly back, yellow belly, spineless person that calls himself a believer, being a poor representation of Christ because Jesus is not a wimp. He's not. Jesus is not some effeminate man putting on a dress. He is a warrior. God created you to be a warrior. So quit letting the devil kick you around. Start doing spiritual warfare with some confidence. Start exercising your authority in the earthly realm because you realize you're seated in the heavenly realm. You have authority in Charleston because you're seated in the heavens. You are commanding from a position in Christ, seated with Him in the heavenly places. And you're looking down and telling the devil, shut up, get out, stop it. You can't do that. No, 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 no! And, and, and why don't you, while you're rebuking some devils, loose some angels? I, I mentioned this a couple weeks ago, but your words energize the angelic or the demonic. When you speak the Word of God, there are angels that are all around you that are waiting to fulfill His Word. They're waiting to move on His Word. When you speak His Word, you commission angels to go before you to fight your battle. Listen to me. You've been trying to make it on your own too long. It is time for you to move into heaven's authority and release the power of the Holy Ghost around you. Release the power of the angelic realm around you and walk in the victory and the authority that God has given you. This is the time for the church to arise and become the change agent in this society. So we have to band together with others who are working to fulfill similar callings in their life. That's why you're here. You're here because the Holy Ghost brought you here. Because you have a purpose. And you need to understand this about North Palm. We're not wanting to create an audience. God sent us to Charleston to create an army. This is an army. And what do armies do? They break things, they destroy things, and they kill. They conquer territories. We are going to break the kingdom of darkness over the holy city. We're going to destroy the foundations of hell that have been dug in this place. And we're going to create a habitation of the presence of God that this region will be known as a region of revival, as a region of reformation. The United States will look at this region and say, that's how you do it. The United States will look at this region and see a reflection of Jesus and there will be an inspiration that begins to go across the fruited plain from sea to shining sea. There will be an inspiration of the Holy Ghost that sweeps across this nation that we can be better. We can do better. We can accomplish more when we turn our hearts toward Jesus. So I declare in the name of Jesus that this city, this place is blessed because the kingdom of God is here. I declare in the name of Jesus that Charleston is the holy city that God 
destined it to be. That this is the gate of heaven. That the power of God comes into the port of Charleston. That the power of God moves through the gate of Charleston and floods up and down the East Coast all the way to Los Angeles, all the way to San Francisco, all the way to Portland, Oregon and Seattle, Washington and over to Chicago, Illinois and down to Houston and Galveston and down to San Antonio and to Phoenix, Arizona and to Miami, Florida and to Savannah, Georgia I declare in the name of Jesus that Minneapolis St. Paul will experience a revival of the Holy Ghost. I declare that Chicago will be a bastion of holiness unto the Lord. I declare that Des Moines, Iowa will be a fruitful basket in the kingdom of the living God. I declare that Dallas, Texas will once again experience the glory of the Lord. I declare in Jesus' name that all of the Appalachian Mountains will be covered in the glory of God. That the Rocky Mountains will flow with the oil of the Holy Spirit. I declare in the name of Jesus that revival will go into Canada that Canada will be redeemed I declare in the name of Jesus that Mexico will experience a shaking of the Holy Ghost that men and women will come to Jesus I declare in the name of Jesus that Central America will burn with the fire of the Holy Ghost I declare in the name of Jesus that Venezuela will be redeemed, that Colombia will be set free, that Ecuador will experience revival. I declare a move of the Holy Ghost in Brazil that will sweep Buenos Aires. I declare Argentina will burn with the fire of the Holy Ghost. I declare that all of Europe will burn with passion for Jesus that the United Kingdom will be delivered from lasciviousness and will be redeemed and established once again in the covenant of blood. I declare that France will be what God has declared her to be, that Germany will once again raise up Martin Luther's. I call for the spirit of reformation in Germany right now. I declare Italy will become the footprint of God once again. I declare in Jesus' name that Rome will be redeemed, that the Vatican will experience revival. I declare Africa will burn with fire, that the prayers of Reinhard Bonnke will not go unheard, that Africa will burn. South Africa, Uganda, Tanzania. I declare declare revival in Nigeria, in Mozambique. I declare revival in Russia, revival in the Ukraine. I declare a move of the Holy Ghost. Come to this earth in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.